All right, welcome everyone. We are at the top of the hour and getting ready to start today's episode of NetDevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston and I will be your host and presenter for today's session on how to automate safely NetDevOps security strategies. Joining me on today's call are Kevin Corbin and Simming Yang. They're gonna be handling questions in the Q&A panel throughout today's session. So please feel free to use those if anything comes up during the content. If you're looking for the slides or code samples or other webinar resources, you can find those posted under the webinar resources for today's session on NetDevOps Live, and we'll drop a link for that inside of the chat panel. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. So before we dive in, a couple of points to consider as we go through. So you are never fully secure. The old adage is that the only secure computer is the one that is turned off and unplugged from everything. So we have to look at security as a continuum with the decisions and the tools and the techniques that you use moving you from a less secure to a more secure spot. Now throughout your, your journey, at, at any point in time, you have to decide what you're going to trust, right? You have to trust something or someone or some system that's out there. That's kind of the nature of how it goes in. And so you're going to make a decision about what devices do you trust. In general, when I'm working, I tend to trust my own devices. So I trust my laptop. I trust my the, the servers that I run my automation scripts from. Like I've decided that I trust those devices. Now in your use cases, your devices may not be trustable, but you have to decide that. Like what are you trusting? And that determines some of the decisions that you'll make about where you put some of your key data that you need to keep secure. Now what we're gonna go through today are some what I consider easy suggestions that everybody should be able to take advantage of starting in their pieces today. Now obviously we're not gonna cover every bit of possible thing you could do to automate more securely. My goal for today's session was to hit some easy areas, some kind of like low hanging fruit so that we can better automate more securely as we go through. Now what are we gonna talk about through the session? We're gonna start out with this discussion around kind of how do we control who has access to our devices through the APIs, looking at some options around authentication, role-based access control, and some best practices um, outside of just API or automation around ACLs and, um, and how we can apply those to our management plane as we go through. Then we're gonna spend a good amount of time looking at how we can manage secrets, usernames, passwords, um, in ways that are different from just kind of burying them inside of our code in clear text, which as we've been called out in several different NetDevOps Live episodes and other DevNet sessions, putting clear text passwords in your code samples is clearly not the best practice. So we're gonna look at some options that we can use instead of that type of a strategy. And then at the end, we're gonna have one more bit of data that I think everybody should start taking advantage of right away, which is to leverage something called the git ignore file as part of your git um, use cases as you commit your code to source control. And we'll dive deeper into that when we get to that section. Now, as I mentioned, security is a continuum where at one end we have less secure deployments and automation and techniques and tools. And then at the other end, we have more secure. And at any point in time, you and your strategies kind of are somewhere on this continuum. And you'll make decisions that will stop you at a point on the continuum saying, this is for this project, this is where I need to be in there. And these are the tools and techniques that we pick. And so through today's session, we're gonna look at different options that will kind of move us along this continuum and help us give some of the, help give you some background so you can pick and choose what makes sense um, to make decisions uh, for different types of use cases as they go in. So our first section here, let's not just let anybody into our devices, API access control strategies. And the first bit we wanna talk about is just this idea about authentication. We don't wanna look at APIs and providing access to our network and our devices with APIs any different than CLI access. It's really important to know who's accessing our devices and potentially what they did with that access as it goes in, so some sort of audit trail. The first step to this is to ensure that you're leveraging unique credentials, right? Avoid those community or team-wide admins or device admins that everybody uses. If we take a look at the logs here from one of the DevNet sandboxes, right? We provide a community account, which means everybody that accesses, everybody will always come in as user developer authenticated successfully. And in this case, we can see this was a NetConf access as it goes in. Now, if this was a production device, these logs wouldn't be terribly helpful to understand who was manipulating or making changes or reading data from our network. 
On the contrary, if we saw logs like this, where individual users were logging in as their own user credentials, so Jay Patterson, Jay Butcher, um, Tom Clancy, right? I had a bit of an author uh, mindset when I was writing some of the content here, but now we can see individual people, where they came in, um, potentially what they did while they were accessed. So these are much better type of a strategy. So a very simple piece, and hopefully something that you've already started to leverage even outside of API access, just for general device administration. Now, once we know who's accessed, it comes into the idea of what are they allowed to do with that access, right? So we authenticate it. Now we're kind of getting into the authorization model that goes in. And there's this concept of the principle of least privilege. And I've got a link down there to a Wikipedia article where you can read more about it. But the short version of it is whenever you're giving access to somebody or a system or an automation routine or a service, only provide the the, the minimum amount of priv uh, privileges necessary for what that purpose is. And so if you've got an account or a system that really only needs to read information, operational state, maybe even configuration state, but never make changes, well then set up that account with read-only authorization, not as a full administrator. Now, different APIs, different applications, different systems will have mechanisms for handling authorization and privilege differently. So you'll have to look at the individual systems that are there. In our screenshot example here, I've gone to a system and set up a read-only account. And so you can see under the chosen user permissions, we can see all, I've got the ability to view circuit, view provider, view cables, view console port. So all of these read-only view access. But things that haven't been issued are things like how to add a log entry or add a group or change permissions, right? These are things that have not been given access to this account. And that's a key part of the principle of least privilege. Only apply the privileges necessary for whatever that tool or that service is going to be doing. Now, for a specific networking example, let's talk a little bit about NetConf, right? So let's say that we wanted to set up and provide access to different operations users, or even if we just wanted for ourselves to kind of prevent ourselves from making um, network changes using NetConf. So we wanted to set up read-only access to our network devices using NetConf as it goes through. Now, by default, iOS XE, the way that it's configured out of the box, is that only privilege 15, so those full network admins or device admins, are allowed any access to NetConf transport and the NetConf models that are in there, and they're allowed full access. Any other type of user doesn't get any access at all using those protocols. Now, built into the NetConf standard is something called NetConf Access Control Model, or NACM. And these are the rule sets that determine who's allowed to access our devices and what they're allowed to do. Now here in our slide, I can see an example where I'm providing a new rule into the rule list, the NACM rule list, for my group will be privilege 01, so priv01 users, so just general users in the system. And we've got a rule that says deny edit config. And so we can see the RPC name of edit config, and we're gonna go ahead and deny action there. Our second rule is to allow get. And so our get RPC is permitted to the users that are there. Now these first two rules determine the RPCs that are allowed to be used by these types of users. And the final rule determines which models those users are allowed to access. In this case, I've got the star, right? The wildcard for every model that's out there. And we're permitting read access there. And so this NACM rule says, okay, anybody that's a Priv01 user, they're allowed to get, but not edit, against all the models that are there. Let's actually see this in action in a demo. So I've switched over here, and so we're going to take a look at, where's my mouse? Find it, there it is. So we're going to take a look at how uh, we could use this for our own use cases. So I'm going to go ahead and SSH into the, one of our DevNet sandboxes, the iOS XE Management Latest Sandbox, as a user, Jay Butcher, that I set up for this demonstration. All right, so I've logged in, but with the wrong password. There we go. So we've logged in and we can see that I've connected and my prompt is just that, just the, the regular prompt. It's not an enable prompt. And in fact, if I do a show priv, we'll see that I, my current privilege level is one. Okay, so that's the access that this user has. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and apply some uh, NACM rules to our device that allows privilege level one users access to read. 
So for that, I've got a script set up here. And so this is the same data body that we looked at in the slide. And we can see that we've got our priv01 users that are allowed, uh, their git allowed, and then to all modules. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply this script to our device. So Python, and this is in the IP access and API priv uh, read only. And so this will print out the rules that are part of this device, all of the NACM rules, so that we can see them as they go through. If I scroll up, we'll see the full NACM body that's here. And we can see the initial rule that I've highlighted here is the default rule that comes with iOS XE. And this shows that it's an admin rule, priv 15, permit everything. That's that default rule. But we can also see the rule that I've added for priv 01 to allow read access that's there. So with the rule applied, let's go ahead and see if we can use it. So I'm gonna use that by leveraging a demo script that I've got here that will connect over NetConf and try to read the information about the device interfaces that are out there. And so this is a general NetConf example. We've done plenty of these in different webinars and examples that are there. And so we'll run Python and then I'm gonna say API, API demo one. And so this will ask me what username we wanna apply. We're gonna use our jbutcher account our password and if I type the password correctly this should connect to the device and provide the list of interfaces and indeed it did so we can see these are the interfaces currently configured on the, this DevNet sandbox now my second demo script here is not a read access it's actually an edit uh, element where we try to create a new loopback interface on this device and so in the script we can see the configuration payload that will be applied and then underneath the code, we can see where we try to send an edit config to the running configuration that's there. So let's try to run this demo script once again as jbutcher and see if it's allowed to go through. So it's asking what loopback do I want to create? So we'll pick one that doesn't exist. So we'll pick 230 with a jbutcher priv01 loop back and an IP address of 1.1.1 .1 and a subnet mask of all 255s. So this will now take that information and try to configure a new interface on the device. And we can see the message that comes back is that there was an error, specifically access denied with the transaction because our priv01 user is not allowed an edit privilege. Now, if I rerun this script, but rather than using jbutcher, we'll use the typical developer, uh, standard developer admin for the sandbox, which is a priv15 user, and we'll try to create a new interface. So this time we'll do 231. We'll say developer priv15 interface, and we'll say 172.16, I don't know, 235.1, and give it a subnet mask. So now we're trying to configure this one out and we'll see if it comes through. Our message comes back that RPC OK is true. That indicates that it seems like it was successful. We'll go back and we'll rerun that first demo script to print out the interfaces and see if jbutcher can see the new interface created by the developer account. And we'll run this one off. Ooh, and I, authentication error because I'm struggling to type passwords today. We'll try this again. And all right, I got it that time. And we can see loopback 231 now exists on the device. And so we've been able to take advantage of the NACM rule sets to isolate per just read only access for our automation scripts. All right, let's head back to our slides and move on. Now the next piece, and actually the last element of this API access section of today's presentation, is all about protecting the management plane. And this isn't new specifically for API types of models. This is actually something that I remember learning back in my CCNA security days about how to attach ACLs to VTY lines to make sure that only approved management traffic was accessing our devices with SSH and Telnet that was there. And so we can do the same thing for our HTTP servers and the other elements for these API management points. The other piece we can do is make sure that we're disabling the insecure protocols. So Telnet, long ago, we've, we learned it was better to replace that with SSH, and NetConf runs over SSH, and so disabling Telnet and enabling SSH is a good plan for that. 
And then for these REST API based interfaces, things like RESTConf, we want to disable the, the, the insecure, just the HTTP server, but enable HTTPS. And so here in the screenshot, we can see a basic access list. I turn off HTTP server. We apply the access class for our management access to the HTTP area. We say set up authentication and then we turn on secure server so that only HTTPS is allowed. And then down on the VTY lines, we go ahead and we attach the access class and again, transport input SSH to turn off the telnet pieces that are there. These are fairly simple and standard things that we can start to work into our devices to make them more secure. And then we wanna strive for some of the harder things to do, things that we've struggled with for years. So moving from password to key-based authentication. We all know that we should do it. We talked a bit about that on an earlier set, uh, episode here in NetDevOps Live. And so that's something that I think is a great idea for us all to consider. And then when we think about those HTTP-based interfaces like RESTConf, moving from self-signed certificates and actually applying for and registering real SSL certificates is another great thing to do to make ourselves more secure as we go through. They are a bit harder, so at the very least, do some of those simple ones that are there. All right, moving into our next section, spilling the beans on secrets. And secrets are a big part of what we have to handle when we're doing network automation. So what is a secret? Well, the answer is really anything you don't want someone else to know. It's no different than when we were in uh, primary school, right? These are things for us today that are credentials, usernames, passwords, IP addresses, tokens, if we're working with a token-based authentication mechanism, maybe even DNS names, or it could be anything about your environment that you don't want publicly available in just any system that's out there. So something like this in our code is probably not the best idea, where we just have a dictionary in our Python code with the address, the ports, the usernames, and passwords for the different devices. Now something to remember, so in DevNet Sandbox, we actually want all this information to be public. We don't consider these things secrets because the intention of these sandboxes is for everybody to use them. But for your environment, that probably isn't the case. And you're looking for a way to kind of secure those down. And so we're gonna look at some different options, moving us again along that security continuum that we talked about. Now, before as we jump into this, I wanna to go to something that the software developers have had to tackle these types of questions in their own code as well. The 12-factor app is something we've talked about in different types of sections. And this is a, a kind of a, a list of 12 uh, practices or concepts or ideas that software developers use as they build out their own applications in this modern world as it goes through kind of cloud native style apps. And there's a lot of great principles inside of the 12 factor app that network developers or network automation engineers can start to pick up on. For today, factor three config is a great one that kind of tackles this specific question. The configuration principle states store your configuration in the environment. And from the 12 factor app perspective, a config details about config are things that are different um, that make a particular instance of an application different from other instances. So the code, right, the actual Python code or the Ruby or the Go or the Docker images, the, those pieces that are the same in every environment, that's not configuration. But things like credentials to external services or access information for other services. These are configuration pieces and those should be stored separately from the actual code itself. And the 12 factor app says we wanna store that in the environment, specifically down here at the bottom in environment variables. And this is a great area that we can start to leverage for our own network automation use cases. So what is an environment variable? Environment variables are dynamically named values that can affect the running processes on your computer. Uh, I love the fact that I'm not writing papers in school anymore, so I can go back to Wikipedia for some great concise definitions. Um, and I've got the link there if you wanna learn more about environment variables in the background. Practically speaking, environment variables are part of every operating system, whether you're a Mac, Windows, Linux, doesn't matter, environment variables are all over the place and you use them without even realizing it. So dollar sign home, right? Our home directory, sometimes shortened as the tilde, right? That is an environment variable. You've probably explored the path, either in Windows or in Bash and Linux, to identify where your applications are stored. The path is an environment variable. 
Even the bash prompt is an environment variable of PS1, right? These are all environment variables. And we can create our own. In a bash environment, you simply use the export keyword, give it a variable's name, such as username, and then a value here as Cisco. And then we can leverage those inside of our code so that we don't have to commit the actual values for username and password in. And so down here we can see an example where I'm actually SSHing into a device by pulling in the password and the username from environment variables. Now before I move on, that example of SSHing using SSH pass and environment variables is a terrible way to connect to a device without a password. There are much better ways for it. It was just a simple example of using environment variables here at the command line. Now let's take a look at how we can actually use environment variables inside of our Python area as it goes through. Python provides a standard library called OS that allows you to interact with an operating system without having to specify details about whether it's a Linux, Mac, or Windows, or any other OS. You can just make the calls to the OS library. And inside there, there's a git env method that goes through. But rather than slide, let's actually take a look at this one in action. So I'm back over here, and so I'm just at my bash prompt. Now let's set some environment variables in my bash prompt that we can go ahead and take advantage of inside of Python. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste these in. And so what I've done is I've created a new environment variable here with these export statements. And we can see I'm exporting sbx underscore address with the, F, the, the fully qualified domain name for one of our always on sandboxes. I'm also creating an environment variable for the netconf port the username and the password that we can use to connect to these devices. Now with the environment variable set, I can go ahead and start my exercises in Python. So I'm gonna fire up IPython. And then in here, I will go ahead and import OS. That's the library that allows me to interface with my operating system. And I can just simply do os.environ to print out all of the environment variables in the system. And in fact, you can see down here, SBX pass, we can see that it's listed. So this gives me the ability to access any of these in a simple key value mechanism. So I can do os.environ, environ, there we go, and then give it a name. So in this case, we'll do SBX user. And so I can print out that username that's there. Now something that's important is what if we try to access an environment variable that doesn't exist? For example, let's say I tried to access an environment variable called SBX missing. I get an actual error, specifically a key error, because we tried to access a key that doesn't exist in the environment variables. Now we don't generally want to throw errors if we can avoid them in our scripts. And so the OS library actually gives us a better method to access the environment variables using a method called get env. And so here we can see I'm creating two new variables, one called address and one called missing. The address one will be os.getenv and then grab an environment variable that we think should exist, right? We created that one. But we're also going to create one called missing. And you'll see I did not get a key error this time. If we look at the values of these, so address is indeed our actual address, and missing comes back with no answer. In fact, if I go ahead and we check it, we can see that missing, missing is none. None is the keyword in Python that represents no value. So when we tried to retrieve using get env, an environment variable that didn't exist, it comes back as none. Now we can use that as part of our checks and balances inside of our code. And so let's go ahead and create a couple of uh, dictionaries to represent some devices. So this first one is going to be our device and it's gonna pull in the environment variables that we did indeed actually set. And then once I've got those, I could use those, I could actually check the values of those. So again, device username gives me the developer that's there. Now if I create another device called bad device, and in this case, we go ahead and we actually provide, we try to get a password from an, a missing environment variable. Bad device will set up, <clears throat> but I can go ahead and see if I have any missing values by doing a quick check, a quick Boolean check of none is none in the list of values for device. And I come back false. Nope, we have everything needed for that one. But what about the bad device? Here, if I look for none in bad device.values, that comes back as true because one of the pieces of information was actually missing. 
And this allows me to build some uh, simple checks inside of my script. And so for example, before I actually go to take advantage of those that information I pulled from the environment variable, I may put something like this if statement in. So if none in device values, so this would say, hey, if I happen to have, if I'm missing a piece of information, I wanna go ahead and raise an exception. And the details that I'll send out to my user is missing key piece of data needed to connect to a device. If I run this now, we'll see that I did not get an exception because again, our device had all the values that we needed. Now with this, we've now gone ahead and we've actually seen how we can pull all of the details necessary to access our device from our environment as it goes through. I'm gonna exit out of IPython and see an actual script example where we're doing this. So if I look in environment variables, where is it? Here it is. So here's my script example. So this is everything that I just did in IPython. So we import OS, but I'm also gonna make a netconf example so we can see that we've got those listed. We're gonna pull in the information about our device from the environment. We'll make sure that all of the information we need exists. And then we'll use NC client to go ahead and connect to our device and use the same example we saw before of just retrieving the list of interfaces. So I'll run that script. <clears throat> Python envvar demo one. And this will run, grab the information from our environment and print all those details out. Really easy to go through and I didn't have to provide inside of my code any of the information about that device. Now building on our environment variables, I wanna talk a bit about this concept of source files so that we can make it easier to kind of work with environment variables. Manually exporting environment variables using that export statement inside of Bash can be really time consuming as it goes through. Probably not something that you want to have to manually do every time you run a script. And so we can actually create um, a file called src underscore env. That's what I tend to name them. There's no specific, you can name it whatever you want. And then inside the value of that file, we just have all of our export statements. And then before we run our script, we simply type source src env and that gives us access to everything that we need that was in there. And then we could run our script. Now, a couple of pieces on this. This comes back to that security continuum and what do you trust? In this use case, I trust the workstation I'm executing the script from. Um, I trust it so that I can put that clear text information in a text file that I feel is secure on the device. If you don't trust the workstation you're on, then obviously this is probably not a good strategy to go after. But once we've got that in place, and so we can kind of see that in action too. If I switch back over here to my code, I can look at my SRC ENV file and we can see here I've got the information about, about everything that's there. And then over in my code, I would simply do a source and this file happens to be in up a directory. So dot, dot, slash, and then SRC ENV. And that brings all those environment variables in. And then I could go ahead and rerun my script. And we'll run it one more time. Using the source files is a great way to kind of um, leverage the environment variables, but also not bury these things in the code and still make it convenient. Now environment variables can be used in lots of tools that are out there. We've talked about things like Ansible and PyATS and Genie on other webinars as they go through. And we can leverage these types of environment variables inside of those. And so here we can see how we're using the lookup filter um, the lookup Jinja filter from, an Ansi from inside of Ansible to search our environment for a particular environment variable and put the values for those inside of like the host, the username and password as they go in. And then inside of Genie testbed files, there's this percent env lookup that we can leverage to do the same thing. And so now we can actually make sure that all of those secure information, those secrets don't exist in the raw files that are there. And we can use that same environment variables that we've been using, but with these other tools. Let's take a look at that in action. All right, I'll clear my screen here. And so what I've got is for my Ansible example, we can see my Ansible host file is really quite simple. It just has the device, right? A name of a device that's out there. And then in the host bars, we can see this is where I've got all my lookup entries to go ahead and pull out the details from the environment variables. Now the one bit to note here, um, we can see that for my Ansible port, the SSH port to connect to, I've hard put in the value of 8181. 
So setting up the demo, there was an interesting bit of information about how Ansible works along with Jinja that was causing me some headaches, and I linked to one of the issues that are there. The short version is, the way that Jinja functions, Jinja always returns an into, or a string value. However, the modules, the network modules, they expect the port information to be an integer. Now there should be ways to do these conversions, however the things built into Ansible currently aren't working. There was several pieces of dialogue in some of the GitHub issues and different forums that I saw where people debating whether this was a bug or this was as intended as it goes through, but I also found some areas where it looks like the Jinja folks may be fixing this on their own. So temporarily here I was unable to easily just bring in that port into Ansible because of that, uh, we'll call it a feature today, a feature of how Jinja works. The rest of these pieces of information we are pulling in from the environment variables because strings are perfectly access acceptable. Now the playbook that we're going to run is a very simple one, kind of sticking with the example that we've been doing, just getting access of the interfaces on our devices. And so we'll go ahead and we'll gather our iOS facts, and then we're going to go ahead and loop over the learned interfaces and just print out the interface information that's there. So let's go ahead and run our playbook, Ansible playbook dash I Ansible hosts for our inventory file, and then we're going to run envvar ansible demo.yaml. This will go ahead and read in the environment variables for the username, the password, the address of the device, leverage those to connect and gather the network facts. That's kind of where we're at right now. And then once it gathers them, it will go ahead and print out the interfaces. And we, here we go, we can see we were successful and we've now printed them out. We can see all of our interfaces, the gigabit interfaces as well as the loopbacks. And so we were able to pull that information out of the environment and take advantage of those inside of our Ansible playbooks. Now similarly, we've got our Genie testbed file here, leveraging the ENV indicators to go ahead and pull out of the environment. And honestly, you'll often see using ENV to grab usernames and passwords as part of the testbed file examples for PyATS and Genie. But you can see I'm also using them to pull out the IP address and the port information for my testbed. Now the script that I've got is a very simple one using Genie to go ahead and initialize the testbed. And again, the testbed will read in those environment. I'll go ahead and grab a specific device, in this case our CSR from our sandbox. We'll connect to the device, We'll learn all about the interfaces, and then we'll simply do a quick loop and print out the details about the, print out the interface names that are there. If I run this example, Genie demo, we'll see this runs. Now when Genie and PyATS connect, by default, they're very verbose. They show you everything that's going on in the background, which is why we're seeing all of the, the output hitting the screen here of Genie connecting, running those commands. And then down here at the bottom, we can see where it printed out the interfaces and the same interface list we've seen from our raw Python example, as well as what we saw with Ansible. We see them once again here as it goes through. So now we've gone through several ways that we can use environment variables to kind of pull our clear text secrets and information out of our code and store them in different ways. But we still are kind of counting on the fact that we trust the machine that we're on. And so maybe, oh, sorry, before we jump into that one, I have one more slide I think to go in here. So how do we share and make the environment variables easier between our teams? Now it's very insecure to take that SRC ENV file, uh, fill it in with your clear text passwords and commit it. That's really no better than putting the clear text information directly in your Python scripts. But we need access to those environment variables wherever we're gonna run our code. And the technique that I often use, and, and I've seen other people leverage, is actually committing something called like SRC ENV dot template to your source control without any of the values in there, but it provides a template for what needs to be created. And then as part of the project documentation, you indicate how to set up the, the actual uh, SRC ENV file as part of the piece that goes through. And so we give an empty template where that we can commit to source control, and then users, when they clone that repo down or they download the code, they simply create the SRC ENV file locally on a trusted machine before they run the code examples that are there. Now, as I was mentioning, this assumes that we trust the machine that we're running from. But what if you don't? What if you don't trust the machine or you're looking for something a little bit more secure? And so if environment variables are not secure enough and you wanna move your way up the security continuum, we can look at things like secret vaults. 
And now we can see Captain Cloud locked behind, right? He's super secure inside of that vault. And we wanna do the same thing with our secrets. So what is a secret vault or a secret store? This will be an additional technology layer or application that's plugged into your automation plans as they go through. And the idea behind this is it's a way to store encrypted versions of all of those secrets that are there. And by encrypting them, it's safe to put them in different locations, like in source control or inside of a database someplace. Now, whenever we encrypt something, there has to be some layer of authentication so that we can actually decrypt and access the clear text versions, because we will likely need access to the clear text versions of these secrets to use them inside of our scripts or inside of our code or playbooks, whatever technology we're working with. Now, a secret store and vault can either be a completely standalone application or it could be a part of an another, another system that you're leveraging. And there are plenty of different options that you can leverage. Kind of the de facto standard for software DevOps teams related to secrets management today is, is a tool called Vault from HashiCorp. HashiCorp is an open source um, uh, kind of software developers tooling company that creates a, a lot of different platforms and tools that are used by software development teams and enterprises and DevOps shops as part of their application and DevOps practices. And Vault is a distributed um, mechanism for storing secure credentials and providing access to them on demand um, for P um, users and systems that need them. Now, Vault has a large number of feature capabilities, which is why it's become so popular. And it can also be plugged into other tools like Kubernetes or pipeline tools like Jenkins. Other options exist as well. So included with Ansible is Ansible Vault, right? It's a way to kind of do, uh, to encrypt uh, either entire files or values within another file and make those secure and safe to store and source control. Even though tools like Kubernetes can integrate with something like HashiCorp Vault, it also has built-in secrets management that you can take advantage of. Uh, IP address management, data center infrastructure management tools like Netbox often have capabilities to store those secrets and information right inside along with the rest of the device information that you're storing that's out there. And then while they can in interface with tools like HashiCorp's Vault, tools like Jenkins and GitLab and these other CI systems often have methods to store just uh, store secrets directly inside of them as well. <clears throat> Making sure that we're in good shape. All right. So let's take a look at how we can actually leverage some of these inside of our use cases as they go. Come on. There we go. So our first demonstration is going to kind of build on something that we've often talked about and we see a lot inside of network automation shops, and that's leveraging Ansible playbooks as they go through. Now, as I mentioned, Ansible Vault is included with Ansible, and it allows us to take an entire variable file, something like this device insecure.yaml that has the clear text versions of our secrets, and then encrypt that entire file into something that looks like this red block, device.yaml, that we could safely store inside of our um, inside of our source control systems. And we do that using the Ansible and Vault keywords that are there. And when we do that, we'll provide a, uh, some sort of a, a password or a pass key that will allow us to encrypt and then decrypt them on demand as they go through. All right, let's see this in action in our live demo. All right, so I'm gonna change. First, we'll clear our screen and we're gonna change into the directory that has these pieces. All right. So inside, what we've got is I've got my device insecure file. So this is the file that has the clear text version of all of my passwords, all of my secrets, all of that information that's there. And this is a file that I would not want to put into source control. What I want to do is create a, uh, an encrypted version of this, and we'll do that with Ansible Vault. So the Ansible Vault here, it's actually a whole set of different things you can do to encrypt or decrypt. And I need to indicate that I actually want to encrypt in Encrypt. There we go. Spell it right. So I want to encrypt the files in this case, and we'll go ahead and we'll run that. All right. So now it's asking for the new vault password. What what is the pass key? What is the password that will be used to encrypt this data? And so this is something that we'll have to remember because we will need it to actually access and use those uh, encrypted values. And so we can see encryption successful. If I go back, we'll look at the new file that was created. And so this is the encrypted version of those uh, in, of the insecure file that we saw. Now this file here is able to be committed into source control because all of that data is completely encrypted. 
Now I can go ahead and use those with my Ansible playbook. So we'll do Ansible playbook, again, inventory file of Ansible hosts, and then our um, playbook we're gonna run is the Vault Ansible demo. It's the same uh, basic playbook task we saw before, but this time we're gonna be using that. Now if I run it like this, we're gonna see that we'll actually get an error. It's attempting to decrypt, but no vault secret was found. So it doesn't know how to decrypt the file that's there. So in order to do that, I have to provide an additional command line attribute of dash dash ask vault pass. Now it will prompt me for my vault password. I still need the same one. So I need to know that. I need some way to keep track of what that password is. That allowed it to decrypt those values for the um, decrypt the values from that file and then use those at, at playbook execution. So here we can see it's gone ahead, it's connected in and then printed out all of the pieces of information that were there, taking advantage of the encrypted versions of the secrets that were out there. This is a great way to go ahead and actually um, take those secured uh, secret information from a, a file um, and make those available and portable. What's also nice about this is I don't actually have to let everybody know what the clear text versions of these secrets are. We could create one version of it, commit that into the repository, and then as long as folks have the key to decrypt those at execution, or the systems that are executing the playbooks have the key, we can go ahead and keep those secure as they go in. Now our next demonstration in here is another way that we can store secrets, but rather than uh, encrypting them and kind of committing them inside of a source control system, we're actually gonna store them in an external solution. And in this case, we'll use Netbox. If you're not familiar with Netbox, Netbox is an open source data center infrastructure management and IP address management tool, so DCIM, IPAM tool, that was originally developed by the team at DigitalOcean led by Jeremy Stretch. It's a great IPAM tool that's making, uh, kind of coming up more and more often as I talk to folks that are working on network automation strategies and net DevOps strategies, because it's a great tool that allows us to quickly start to gather and act as a source of truth for our devices, uh, connection information, IP addresses, all of these pieces that are there. And because it was built with automation in mind from the ground up, we've got an API that we can leverage to access the information that's in there. Now, in addition to IP addresses, devices, we can see here in this yellow box, it has support for storing secrets along with the devices that are there. It encrypts those secrets using private public key encryption, and that's how we access them as well. There's um, robust capabilities to identify which users are allowed to access which types of secrets and from which devices. So very robust technology that we can do, we can use inside a netbox. So our first demo will actually kind of see how we can put secrets into our system. And so here I have a development instance of Netbox running on my laptop that gives me access and I've gone ahead and populated it with some basic information about our DevNet sandbox. And so we can hear it's, we can see here it's our CSR and this IP address is the IP behind that public DNS name that we've been seeing as the SBX address. Now I'm gonna go ahead and you, um, you can see I'm not logged in yet and we don't even see the secret section. It's not even displayed yet. If I go ahead and log in, we'll say login as admin. Now I can see that I've got a secret that's available there. Now if I try to unlock that secret to view it here in the window, we can see that I'm being prompted to enter a private RSA key. The way that the encryption works inside of Netbox is again all based on this public private key who's allowed to go through. Before I request the session key, let's kind of see some of that in the back end. If I take a look at the profile for admin, and then I look at user key, we can see that I've provided in here, we've got the public key for this admin user that's there. And that public key is used to kind of manage all the encryption pieces and access that's behind. But I currently have no active session key. A session key is a temporary key that would allow access to those secrets, either to create new ones or read the ones that already exist in the system. And that's what that prompt was to provide the private key, was to create a session key for me to go ahead and access secrets. I'll switch back to devices, take a look at this device, and now I will try to unlock this, and it needs my private RSA key. I've stored that over here, so if I go back to my code, where is it? Here we go. And so right here is the private RSA for today's demo. So don't bother writing it down. It's gonna get deleted as soon as the uh, this, this video is over, but this is the private key that goes along with the public key that we saw on the window. So if I switch back, I can go ahead and just paste that in here and request a session key. 
And now up here at the top, I can see session key received. I may now unlock secrets. So I've established a session key. So now when I hit the unlock button, we can see that it displays the value of the secret that's there inside of the web interface. And I could copy it out if I needed it. And go ahead and relock it so we don't see it. Now I can use that session key to add additional secrets. So let's add the username and password secrets for this device. So this will be a general type of secret. It will be the username and we'll put them in. And you'll notice here as I type it, it's actually hidden and start out as it's entered. It will make sure that I type them the same both times. Let's hope that I did. Now I need to add a password as well. So I'll say create this one, add another one and we will add a general one and this will be the password. And I'll put the password for the sandbox in uh, and create that one as it goes out. And so we went ahead and created it. If I jump back to the device, we can now see that I've got my three pass or my three secrets have been created and I can unlock them and take a look as well. So there's the developer account or username. There's our Cisco 12345 password. And once again, the port that's accessible. So this is how we can manage and take a look at, add new secrets into a particular device as they go through. But how do we use these secrets inside of our code? And so that's what we're gonna take a look at next. With NetBox and the API that's available, as well as the SDKs that they make available, it's very easy to include secret retrieval inside of your Python scripts as they go in. And so in this example, we're going to see how we're using that inside of Python using the PyNetBox library. So I need to know what device am I trying to run this script for? So in this case, I'm actually asking the user. The whole idea here is I don't want anything stored locally along with this script. I want to have the user provide input to the details that are needed. And so it asks the user, what is the device that you want to pull from? I've gone ahead and just kind of hard coded the URL for the NetBox server. In this case, it's again running locally on my local workstation. And then it needs to know the API token. And so it's going to ask, what is your NetBox API token? Now the username and passwords are how we log in through a web interface with NetBox, but like many systems, NetBox uses API tokens for token-based authentication. And so it's asking, what is the token that we'll use to connect to the API? We'll see in just a second how we can pull that out of the interface. And then finally, we need to know the private key file. Where is the private key necessary for secret access? Now, if my script was only trying to access device information and IPs, things that are not secrets, then I wouldn't need to provide the private key file. That's only needed if I want to get access to the secrets that are there. Once I've got that information, then my script can go ahead and create a PyNetBox API object with those details. It can retrieve um, a device object based on the device name. So netbox.dcim.devices.git, what's the name of the device? Once I have the device, I can grab its IP address using device.primaryIP. And then for the secrets, we use the secrets um, objects inside of the NetBox library. So we netbox.secrets.secrets.git, which device, so device ID equals the NetBox device ID, and then specifically the username secret, and then the password, and then the netconf port. So those are the mechanisms to go ahead and pull those secrets out at runtime from NetBox as they go through. So let's actually watch this code and kind of take advantage of it. So I'll switch back here, we'll clear my screen, get rid of the key, and I'll open up the NetBox demo file. So this is the actual script, and so this has got the section that we saw from the slide, right? So we can see our NetBox URL, we can see where we're asking the user for the information, and then we can see where we created our NetBox object for the API connection, and then here's where we're actually pulling out the different secrets based on what's needed. And when I run this, it will ask me for the information necessary. So let's put that to work. So Python, and this is vault, netbox demo. So what is my device name? My device name is CSR1000V-1. What is my API token? So to get that, we'll go back to our netbox environment. And we can see here under admin and profile, there's API tokens and it's listed right here. So I'll go ahead and copy my API token and I'll provide that into my script. Now I'm using the git pass to pull the information or ask the user for the password. And that is used so that it doesn't actually show to the screen. It's indicated here by this key. So when I paste this in, we don't actually see it in the terminal, right? I don't wanna display my API token or a password 
to whoever happens to be watching. And then where's the private key for access? Well, the private key is just called ID RSA. It's in the local directory I'm at. So we can see that it's retrieving device information from NetBox. And so this message is kind of showing where we are in the script. And so that's right here. Uh, uh, where is it? Right here. So retrieving information from secrets from NetBox. Once it's done that, it then prints out. We can see it moved on to connecting to device to retrieve interface list. And that's where it kicks off to that typical NetComp flow that we've seen in all of the demos so far. I, and if I scroll down, we'll actually see where it fully was able to pull up the interface list from the device that was out there. So once again, my script didn't have to have the, the actual secrets embedded in it. And furthermore, I didn't have to have some version of the secrets on my local workstation. I even asked the user specifically for all the details that were there. All right, now before we finish up and we kind of close things down, one more thing I wanna talk about. And that's how we can actually keep our, our code itself and our repositories a little bit safer as we're working with it. And it's using a, a technique or a, a file called gitignore that's part of the git standard. Now gitignore is not something from GitHub or GitLab. It's just part of Git itself. And the idea here is that you create a file called dot gitignore, and then you list out the files you want git to ignore. And right? it's a pretty well-named file in that place. And what we do with it is we put the gitignore file either in any directory or just at the root of the repository. And then anything that we put into that list will be ignored. There are standard ignores for different types of languages. So if you're working in Python, you'll often ignore your VE and V directory, right? We don't want to commit our virtual environment contents into our source control system. It makes more sense to kind of replicate that using kind of a requirements file or something like that. Similarly, when we run a Python file, it generates PYC, these kind of like intermediate compiled versions of the files. We don't want to commit those either. There's a whole list of standard ignores that are provided for different types of languages. But you can add any of your own as well. And so here in the example, we can see that I'm ignoring anything that has insecure in the file name, right? That's a common one. If I label something insecure, I don't want that to be committed. We put it in our git ignore. The SRC ENV file that we talked about for sourcing, right? We don't want to uh, commit, we don't want to commit that in the source control. Anything that might have secrets in the name or credentials or a private key, ID RSA, right? Things that we want to ignore inside. Now you can put anything inside of your own git ignore files as they go through. Now git ignore files prevent you from accidentally, like mistakenly or unintentionally committing these files up. You can always add a file into your repository using the dash F flag. So git add dash F and then provide the name of a file. And even if it's listed in the git ignore, it will still add it because you're forcing it to go through. What's nice about the git ignore is that if you start getting into the habit of just doing like git add and then maybe dot to add the entire folder directory that you're in or the entire repository, it will go ahead and ignore all of these types of insecure secret based files or anything else you don't want inside of your repository without you having to explicitly add file by file as it goes through. Git ignores are another really quick and easy technique and, uh, that you can leverage for your use cases to make yourself automate and code more securely. All right, with that, we have come to the end of today's webinar, kind of running through the different tips that are there. Now we covered quite a bit across today's hour. Right, we talked about the spectrum that security in our automation is. The decisions we make will move us somewhere along the spectrum from less secure to more secure. And depending on your project and what your requirements are, you're gonna make decisions that fit you someplace on that spectrum. We talked about managing access to our APIs by providing authentication, right? individual authentication, and then authorizing those accounts for the least amount of privilege necessary as they go through as well as that common kind of long lived best practice for network management of attaching access lists and disabling insecure management uh, protocols on our devices as they went in. Then we spent a lot of time kind of talking about secrets, username, password management with our automation. We saw kind of at the, um, uh, along the spectrum, we can use environment variables and source ENV files to store those secrets kind of in our, in, um, uh, in runtime memory as environment variables and have our code access those, whether that be Python or an Ansible playbook, Genie or really anything as they went in. 
And then if you need to move yourself farther along that continuum of security, we took a look at some examples on how we can secure and encrypt those using vault technologies like Ansible Vault or store them in a secret store like Netbox. And then finally, we reviewed kind of how we can use git ignore files to prevent ourselves from mistakenly committing files that we don't want in our repositories, potentially files that have some of those secured, uh, secured data that's in there. Now, if you're interested in the resources for this, along with the webinar resources, I've got links for the NACM model that we talked about with um, iOS XE, as well as how we can leverage ENV lookups for both Ansible and PyATS and then links for the Ansible Vault as well as the Netbox Secrets documentation. So you can jump in and read more about that. Now, if you wanna get hands-on with some of the examples, all of the demos that I went through, as well as a little bit more context around them, I've documented those as a guided walkthrough along with the sample code for today. And so you can jump in and you can actually clone the repo down and you can walk through all of the examples from the NACM examples to the uh, environment variable examples, even all the way up into the vault examples with both Ansible and Netbox. So take a look at those. And if you're just interested in the code samples, obviously we've got those posted as well. Now, as always, from a code exchange perspective, here's mine for you. Take one of the projects that you're working on now, or maybe something that you've already submitted to Code Exchange, and raise it, move it along the security continuum by maybe implementing something like a, an e, a source ENV template. Right? Make, put those changes in, update your README so that folks, when they clone it down, they go ahead and they take advantage of these types of technologies. Make your own code examples a little bit more secure and start using some of these practices that are out there as they go in. Now, as always, we have a ton of information on NetDevOps across DevNet. We've got our blogs, our video series, our webinars, all of these areas. So be sure to join and check out all of the resources that we have. And if you want to stay in touch, I certainly want to hear from you. Please reach out. I'm hapresto at cisco.com on WebEx Teams or email or hfpreston on uh, Twitter. And be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias. You'll find them at Cisco DevNet just about everywhere as they go in. With that, we are at the end of today's session. I want to thank you all for joining me. Hopefully you enjoyed it, you got some of it out of it, and I look forward to seeing you all at next week's episode of NetDevOps Live. Talk to you all soon. Bye.